Hello, welcome to the Intrepid Museum's new live virtual programming. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing your questions throughout the program and we'll try to address as many as we can. The museum's live streams are free. If you would like to support us in delivering this, this exciting content, please click the link below in the description. My name is Margaret Gambaro, and I am an educator at Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. I will be your host today as we learn about just some of my favorite aircraft on board and just a little bit about how they fly. So at first, so let's get started. All right, so this is a picture of Intrepid Museum. And one thing that I love about Intrepid is that, um, is that, that we are mostly located on the former aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. Now, Intrepid um, served in the US Navy from 1943 to 1974. It served during World War II, the Cold War, it was a recovery vessel for NASA, and it served during the Vietnam War. It has been a museum here in New York City since 1982. So I just wanna take a second and I want us to look at Intrepid. And I want you to tell me anything that you notice about Intrepid, just to get us started off. Is there anything that you notice? All right, one thing that I notice is just how large it is. So Intrepid is about 900 feet long. It's about three football fields long. And it's also about, oh, eight, about eight stories high. So this is a very large ship. And so, yeah, so there's that. And then also, if you see the, oh my goodness, if you see the um, point that come out the front, those are a part of the catapult system. And we will talk a little bit about that later, but that's what helped planes take off on top of the Intrepid. And if you look really, really close at this picture, you'll see some tails of our, um, you'll see some tails of our aircraft. So we have about 27 aircraft on board Intrepid today. All right. So we are located in New York City. We are on the Hudson River. So in this picture, if you look here, there's the Hudson. This is New Jersey over here. And then this is the west side of Manhattan. And if we look at all of our piers, we will see Intrepid. So I want you just to take a second and see if you can find Intrepid at one of the piers. And what you do, I want you to just point at it. All right. Great, so let's look at our piers. So at the bottom, we'll see these smaller boats. That's the circle line. They do tours, that's not intrepid. And then if we look at this pier, there is a bit of um, some grass and then there's also a smaller boat. And that also, that's a park, not intrepid. But if you look at this long, long ship that is almost as long as the pier, that is indeed Intrepid Museum. And if you look close to our pier, you'll see that our, we'll see our Concorde, which was the fastest passenger jet. And you'll also see a little, little, little bit of our submarine growler. 
So as I mentioned before, Intrepid served in the U.S. Navy from 1943 to 1974, and it served as an aircraft carrier. So I want us to take a look at this picture, at these pictures. One is of Intrepid while it was in service. And the other one is Intrepid as a museum today. And so during its long service, Intrepid did go through a few changes. So I just want to see if anybody notices anything different between these two pictures. So do we notice anything different? All right, so if we look at the picture on the left, we'll notice that that picture is in black and white. That's because this is an older picture. This was taken in the 1940s when Intrepid was serving in World War II. So that picture is almost as old as Intrepid. It's almost 77 years old. And, and also, you may notice that there are a lot more planes on top of um, Intrepid when it was in service. So all of these, these are all aircraft. But then again, over here, there just be, there, we just see a little bit of some tails. So when Intrepid was in service, it would have about 50 to 100 aircraft on board. When right now, like I said, we have about 27. And another thing, as if you look at this white around the picture in the water, you'll see that that means that Intrepid was moving. So Intrepid sailed all over the world. It sailed to Europe many times. It sailed to East Asia, South Asia, um, Australia, let's think, um, South America, the Caribbean, Africa. It went to basically every continent instead of Antarctica. It went all over the world. And we can tell that it's moving. And so I want us to make our own ship with our hands. So what I want us to do is I want us to take both of our hands and I want us to put them palms up. And then we are going to put our fingers together, our pinkies together, then bring the tips of our fingers together. So then it's kind of like a pointy cup shape. And this is ship in American Sign Language. And so we can make our ship kind of zoom around like it, like Intrepid was when it was in service. Maybe it hits some waves up and down, or maybe it hit a wave on the side and that's not good. So yes, so Intrepid went all around, but now as a museum, we just stay and um, we just stay at Pier 86 at um, 12th Avenue and 46th Street. We do not move. We are tied down. All right. So yes, and also something that I think is a really interesting is that if you look closely at these two pictures, you may notice that the shape and the size is a little bit different. So when, Intre so when we entered the jet age, Intrepid got a couple of makeovers that made its um, flight deck longer and it also um, added an angle flight, an angle to the flight deck to help, uh, to help the jets come in for a landing. So that is also really cool. All right, and as I mentioned, Intrepid is an aircraft carrier, which means it is an airport at sea. So planes and helicopters would take off and land on top of Intrepid. And just like we made a ship with our hands, we can also make a plane and helicopter with our hands using American Sign Language. So to make a plane, what you do is you take a fist, then you put your pointer finger up, then your thumb out, and then your pinky out. So now you have your nose and your two wings. Then you just kind of put it forward and you can take your other hand 
and just put it flat with your palm up and that can be your runway. So you can take off and kind of zoom all around and then bring it back in for a landing. But there was also helicopters that took off and landed on board Intrepid. And to make a helicopter, you take one hand and you just do, just kind of put your pointer finger up like we're number one. Then you take your other hand and you kind of put it out like you're about to give a high five. And you put your high five hand on your finger and then you kind of just like wiggle your fingers. And you can take off, zoom around with your helicopter and then bring it back in for a landing. So today I am just going to show you some of my favorite aircraft and just talk about them a little bit. But first, let's think about what make aircraft special. And to do this, we are going to do a science experiment. What we are going to do is we are going to stand up. So here, let's all stand up. And then we are going to jump in the air and try to stay there. So three, two, one, jump. I wanna know, did anybody stay up in the air? Did anybody stay up in the air? No. Why didn't we stay up in the air? Does anybody know? What's the force that kind of pulled us back down to the earth? So that would be gravity. Gravity is the force that's constantly just pulling us back down to the earth and keeping us on our chairs right now. And gravity is one of the four forces of flight. So we have lift, which is the one that brings us up. We have thrust, which is the one that brings us forward. Drag, the one that pulls us back. And gravity is the one that pushes us down. And all aircraft uses, either uses or try to go, like either use these or try to work against these when they are flying at different, at different parts. But different aircraft manipulates them differently. So we are going to go and talk about our first aircraft. So this is the Avenger. This is the oldest aircraft in Intrepid's collection. And I want us to take a second and I want you just to look at this picture of the Avenger. And I want you just to tell me what you notice about Avenger. Is there anything that you find interesting or that you may have a question about? So what do you notice about Avenger? Hmm. Let's kind of take a look. Maybe take a look at the top of Avenger, at the bottom, at the side, and at the other side. So one of the biggest things that I notice about Avenger is the wings. Avenger, so these wings kind of look like that they are broken, but they are not. These are specially designed to be on an aircraft carrier. So if we all put out our arms as if we were airplanes, and then we started pivoting, we would probably start running into things. Like I am now running into the wall, the chair that's next to me. I'm running into a lot of things. This is very uncomfortable to do. So now let's bring our wings in and fold them in. And we're going to do some pivoting. Now I'm not touching anything. So these are wings that are created to bend backwards in order to share, in order to save space. Because not only would Intrepid have 50 to 100 aircraft on board, 
It would also have about 3,000 men serving on board as well. So even though it's a really big ship, it's not that big. So they needed to so they needed to save as much space as possible so people and aircraft could move around the space safely. So yes. And then another thing that I noticed about Avenger is what's on Avenger's nose. So it's on the very front of Avenger right here. So Avenger is a propeller plane. And how a propeller plane works, or how a propeller works, is that similar to my fan right here, a propeller spins really, 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 really fast. And what it does is that it moves air back, so then my plane can go forward, which is very cool. And you can also kind of make a propeller with your hand if you want to just kind of spin around really fast and feel any air that's moving. Kind of feels nice. All right, and then, then the next thing that I notice about Avenger is Avenger's color. So Avenger is dark blue on the top. Then as you go down, it slowly gets lighter until the bottom when it's white. So Avenger is a type of camouflage. And basically Avenger would always fly over the, um, would always fly over the ocean. So if you look down at Avenger, it would be blue like the ocean. But if you looked up at Avenger, it would be white like the sky. And also this type of camouflage makes it really hard to see the outline of Avenger 2 while, um, of Avenger while it's moving. Some animals have the same type of camouflage. Um, Sharks and penguins both have the same type of camouflage, which is very cool. Now, Avenger would always fly in a group. And it also would have a group flying inside. So at the front of the airplane, you have the person flying it. Does anybody know the name? of a person who flies an airplane. What is the name of a person who flies an airplane? What is that job called? All right, it is called a pilot. So we have the pilot up here in the front. Then back here, we would have the gunner. And then in the fuselage or the body of the airplane, you would have the radio man. And the radio man was the GPS of the plane. They were the, they were the ones that were constantly talking to the pilot and the ship, trying to, tell, um, trying to tell the ship where they were and getting orders on where to go and then telling the pilot where to go. So they were kind of the in-between person. And there was these three people who would fly an Avenger, but there was also a lot more people who would take care of Avenger. So as I mentioned before, there would be 3,000 people serving on board Intrepid. And not all of those 3,000 people are going to be pilots, gunners, or radio men. There's a lot of other jobs. And so in this one, we see some mechanics at work. And these make, and there would be quite a few mechanics assigned to different planes to make sure that these planes stayed safe because you did not want any faulty planes taking off um, from Intrepid because that would just be bad news bears. Nobody wants a faulty plane, nobody. Because if the plane doesn't go up, it only goes one other way and that is down and that's not good. So yes. So that's a little bit about Avenger, but let's look at another plane that we have in our collection. This one is actually right behind Avenger in our museum. And this plane is called the Fury. 
The Fury was one of our first jet planes that served on board Intrepid. Now, if you notice, the jet plane is different from a propeller plane. If you look at its nose, you'll notice that the propeller is missing. And that's because how a jet plane works. So in the most basic, 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 basic explanation, I will tell you that and show you. And remember, this is basic. And that is you. And that is um, a jet plane pretty much sucks in air. And then that air, it mixes with the fuel and the fire that's created by the pistons. And it mixes and mixes and mixes. And then it is whew, shot out from the back. And so because of this, Jets go a lot faster than propeller planes. So that is um, a little bit about what a jet does, but let's look at this plane in particular. And I want you just to look at it and tell me what you notice about Fury. So you can look, so if there's anything interesting that you notice, any questions you may have about Fury? So let's just take a second and look. Look at the top of Fury, at the bottom, the front, and the back. So one thing that I always notice and just really enjoy is the lightning bolt on Fury. And that's and if we look at the lightning bolt and think about it, there's also a connection with a superhero with the lightning bolt. And that superhero is the Flash. And the Flash is one of the fastest, 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 or the fastest superhero ever. And like I said, the Fury was one of the first jet planes and jet planes are so much faster than propeller planes. So they wanted to show off how fast this jet plane was on board Intrepid by painting a lightning bolt on the side to be like, yeah, this is like fastest lightning. Not really, but that's what they're trying to say, which is very cool. So also what we're going to do with Fury is we are going to talk about something called controlled surfaces. So planes just don't go um, forward. They also pivot. They go up and down and they also roll. So we're going to look at how that is done. So the first controlled surface we're going to look at is the aileron. And you can say that with me, aileron. It's a very fancy, fancy word. And the ailerons are these, um, are the, these flaps on the end of the on the end of the um, wing. Ooh, almost forgot what a wing was there. And they go up and down, and that helps the plane do something called a roll. And we can put our wings out, and we can do a roll ourselves. So, it does a roll just like this. And that's what an aileron does. And then we can also look at the rudder. And the rudder is that yellow flap and it also moves back and forth. And the rudder helps the plane do um, something called a yaw, which is one of my favorite names for something. And the yaw is when it pivots. So this is a yaw. And then we also have our elevators. And elevators help the plane do a pitch. So that's when it goes up and down. So our different maneuvers are roll, pitch, and yaw. Do a little airplane yoga. 
Now we don't have just airplanes on board Intrepid. We also have uh, we also have helicopters, and this helicopter is called the Hup, and it is a retriever. And it is really, I find it really cool because unlike a lot of helicopters that the um, that the tail rotor is on the side, the hubs is on top of it. So we have the tail rotor that's actually at the top. And that's because the hub was, like I said, it was a retriever. So it would go out and it would save pilots that had, that had crashed. And it would also go out um, to supply vessels and it would bring back um, replenishments. So those are two things that A, it needs to be steady and B, it needs to hold a lot of stuff. So to help that, there are the two rudders on top that one spins one way and the other one spins the other way. So we can try to do this. So do one of your hands spinning counterclockwise and the other one spinning clockwise and try to do that at the same time because this is how the rotors on the hub would spin. And that, by making them spin like this, it, was, it would help keep the hub nice and steady. And it would also help it be able to carry a lot of heavy stuff. So here. And so this is a picture of, of one actually going to pick a person up. So actually in action, going, picking up a person, which is pretty cool. Now, and also something that's cool about just helicopters in general is how they take off. So airplanes, they need a runway. They need to build up a bunch. So they need to build up a bunch of um, speed in order to get lift. When helicopters, they just spin their rotors. Again, similar to my fan, the rotors spin really, really fast and it pushes the air down so my helicopter can go up. So they can take off and land vertically, which is really cool and it's really great when you're on an aircraft carrier and there's only so much space for um, taking off and landing, which, we will get to. So as I mentioned before, um, Intrepid had a catapult system to help airplanes take off. And that's because the runway on Intrepid is about 350 feet long, give or take. When the average, uh, when a lot of um, runways in real life, like on land, are about a mile or maybe even longer. So that is a huge, huge difference. And like I said, planes need to pick up speed in order to get lift. So what they used was the catapult system. And basically what it was is by the jet age, it was a steam, steam catapult. So it, there was these giant, giant, giant pipes that would just create, that would just build up, build up, build up, build up steam until it boom, let go and release and would shoot the plane off the front. It kind of works, even though my, my slingshot is a little broken, sadly. It's done a lot of, done a lot of slinging lately, but it kind of works like, like, well, like my slingshot here, that my slingshot, when I pull it back, it creates pressure on my um, rubber bands. And then when I let go, it shoots towards the front. So yes, yeah, so basically a giant steam slingshot is what shot the planes off the front, which is very cool. That can also be kind of an inconvenience. So that what brings me to my 
next plane. Hopefully, if I remember correctly. Yes. Haha. -ha. So yes, to my next plane. Now this plane never, this type of plane never flew off of Intrepid, but it is a very important plane. It, it's just a very important plane and one of my favorites. Like I grew up going to a lot of um, air shows when I was younger. And anytime when this plane came out, it was like, yes, Harrier time. Awesome. Everybody be quiet. This is going to be great. And that's because the Harrier does something that not a lot of other airplanes can do. And here. And I will be able to show you that. Hopefully, cross your fingers. So, in this video, the Harrier takes off on a runway, normally. Like, you know, just Margaret, that's nothing very special. Like, that's cool, whatever. There's a plane taking off, cool. But then when it comes in for a landing, it is just hovering. And then it is going to slowly land vertically, which we can watch right now. Because again, favorite. This is just, when I was a kid, I thought this was like the coolest thing in the world to watch. So yes. Oh, ah, no, that's not what I wanted. Go to the next slide. There we go. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so a Harrier, so Harriers, there's something called a jump jet. And jump jets, they can take off and land vertically, and they can also hover. So at these um, air shows that I mentioned, usually the um, pilot would kind of hover and they would go forward and something really cool that not a lot of planes can do, they would also go backwards. Because planes, they usually just move forward. But going backwards, that's whoo, something totally different. Very cool. So yes, and they can do that because of um, their jet exhaust, their jet blast. And this is the exhaust of um, one of the jet engines on our Harrier. And I want you to take a second and I want you to look at that and tell me what do you notice that's interesting about this? Because this does not look like a regular jet black, like jet exhaust. It's very different. So I want you just to take a moment and look at it and tell me what you notice that's kind of interesting or that you may have a question about. All right. So Notice that it's not really connected all the way to, or it's not solid um, to the rest of the jet engine. And that's because it moves. It's able to move down when it wants to take off vertically. So it would shoot the jet blast down. So then it would take off vertically or it can move upward. So when it was um, landing vertically, or move different ways so it can go front or back, which is very, very, very cool that it can do all of these different maneuverings. All right, so now we are at our final plane that I'm going to talk about. This is one of my favorites. And this is the A-12. And the A-12 is the fastest jet ever. It was, I like to call it the kind of the big brother of the SR-71 or the big sibling of the SR-71 because um, it was, because the SR-71 was its predecessor. 
So, and I want us to take a second and I want us to look at the A12. And I want you just to tell me what you notice about the A12. What do you see? And again, I want you just to look at the top, look at the bottom, the front and the back and see if you notice that the, if there's anything interesting about it, anything that you might have questions about, just anything at all. All right. So the A12, the first thing that I notice is just how flat it is. So it is a flat and pointy, pointy, pointy plane. And that's so it could just slice through the air because it would go just so fast that it just needed to be as thin and pointy as possible. And also these giant jet engines. So this is just one and there's going to be, and there's another one on the other side, on the other wing. And these jet engines are huge. And it was so big to help it go as fast as it did, which this plane, it went Mach 3. So three times the speed of sound. So to put that in context, it takes about five-ish hours to go from um, New York to California. And this plane would do that in about one hour. It's a very, very fast plane. And also because of that, the, um, so the majority, so this plane only fit one person, just the pilot that sat up in front in the cockpit the rest of it was pretty much just for fuel because when you go through that fast, you eat up fuel like crazy. And another thing about the fuel that is, again, so cool is that it would, when they would, look, when they would fill it up with fuel while it was on the ground, it would actually leak the fuel a little bit. That's kind of weird. I wonder why it did that. So we're going to do a quick science experiment again. And what we're going to do is we are going to take our hands, put them together, and then we're just going to start rubbing them. And then we're going to start rubbing them really, 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 really fast. And you will notice that your hands are starting to get hot. So when the A12 was going Mach 3, it was creating a lot, a lot of heat. And metal expands when it's heated up. So in order to compensate for it, for the metal expanding so much, a lot of the panels on the a lot of the panels on the A12 are actually slightly accordion shaped. So they kind of go up and down. And that's so when it, so when it was um, so when it was really, really hot while it was flying, it had that room to expand, which is, again, really cool. And another thing is that this plane was a spy plane. It was created during the Cold War, and it was, it was created during the Cold War, and it was used to pretty much to spy on the USSR. And during the Cold War, as I mentioned, spying on a USSR, that was who we were, that's who the US was kind of keeping an eye on. We were both kind of keeping an eye on each other. And it's just kind of this funny thing though about this plane and the Cold War, other than that it was a spy plane, and that is that this plane is made of titanium. And the majority of titanium on Earth is in Russia, AKA at the time, the USSR. So, what the US military had to do, our US government had to do, they had to create a bunch of different shell corporations to secretly buy as much titanium as they could in order to build this plane, in order to get 
the titanium they needed to build these planes. Which again, crazy. It's just like the craziest spy story in the world, the story of this plane. And it even gets better. My final thing about the plane and one of my favorite things about it is that it was built and tested at none other than Area 51. Yes, the Area 51, where there was a bunch of UFO sightings in, oh wait, the 60s? That is when this plane was being built and tested. So it is very easy to believe that a lot of those UFO sightings was actually people testing the A-12 because this plane looks nothing, nothing like any other plane in the 1960s. It doesn't look like any other, really any other plane now. So if you were just a person just chilling out in Nevada and then you saw a, this plane flying over ahead, you're gonna think, you're not gonna know what that is. You're gonna think it's an alien. You're gonna think it's a UFO. So yes, so that is another one of my favorite parts about this plane. And our final thing is just, since it flew so fast, it had to fly really, really high up. So high up that you can see here, the pilot is wearing a pressurized suit. So it, there is such a, so it was so high up and there was so little atmosphere that the pilot would have to wear a pressurized suit. And you could actually also see the curve of the earth when you are flying in the A-12. All right. So that is what I have for you today. Thank you for watching and sharing your questions and comments. The museum has introduced a number of new live streams. Please follow and subscribe to this channel or visit our website for the latest streaming schedule. Links are below in the description. Again, look, look below in the description. If you are able, your donations are any, um, your donations of any amount help keep programs free and low cost or explore becoming a member. So again, thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with me and I hope you have a lovely weekend. Goodbye.